You've likely heard that the only way you can lose weight and body fat is by counting your calories and being in a calorie deficit, a situation where you're consuming less calories than you expend or you're expending more calories than you consume. This is a calories in, calories out energy balance theory, and the only problem with it is it has a number of shortcomings, a few of which I'm going to show you in this video. To start things off, we'll begin with the most fundamental shortcoming of the energy balance theory, and that is that it's not the main determinant of weight loss or gain. Don't believe me? Try this little experiment. Fill up a mug of water with boiling water. Now put your hand on the wall of the mug and you'll notice how the mug is quite warm. Now tip the hot water out and replace it with the same volume of cold water. Now put your hand on the wall of the mug again and you should feel that there's a lot cooler to touch. In this scenario, the heat content going into the mug, the calories, decreased, but the mass of water remained the same. In the same way, you can reduce your caloric intake with all other things being equal, but still maintain the same body mass. Let me explain. How most foods are attributed their caloric values on their food labels is by igniting them in what's called a bomb calorimeter, and then measuring the transfer of heat energy to the body of water around the bomb. This measure of heat energy is what's used to determine the food's energy value or calories. There's a problem with this though. A bomb calorimeter is a closed thermodynamic system, meaning that although there is energy transfer across the system's boundaries, there is no mass transfer taking place. This is very unlike the human body, which is an open thermodynamic system, where there is both mass and energy exchange across its boundaries. Yes, you breathe, you eat, you poop, you fart, and these are all examples of mass exchange with your environment, not just energy exchange like in a bomb calorimeter. Also, you metabolize and not burn food, to be fair. By now you should be starting to see how calories represent the heat released upon food oxidation and do not determine your body mass. When you stand on the bathroom scale, the reading does not measure your calories. The scales measure your body mass and of course the force exerted on it by gravity. What determines your body mass is not energy flow or calories in versus calories out, but rather mass flow, mass in versus mass out. Mass in refers to the daily absorbed nutrients via your diet like macronutrients and water while mass out refers to nutrients lost via oxidation and excretion, like CO2, urea, etc. So whether it's the intake of one gram of protein, carbohydrate, fat, or water, your body mass increases by exactly one gram, independent of the substrate's calories. Therefore, it's the combined weight of all the nutrients going in and out of your body that determines your weight and body composition, not the amount of energy in or out. I covered this in a previous video where I transitioned from a diet that was 2400 calories per day to one that was 400 calories higher but had a mass deficit with all other things being equal. I encourage you to check this video out later on and I'll put a link for this in the description to this video. If you've been frustrated with the lack of weight loss by eagerly reducing your caloric intake, you can perhaps now understand why. Energy balance and mass balance are separate balances in the body and both can go in different directions. This also explains how someone might have had success losing weight whilst following a low calorie diet or imposing a calorie deficit. In these instances, both net energy and mass balance were negative and the weight loss was the result of the underlying mass imbalance. And not all the mass that you take in has an energy value either. You can take in energy providing mass such as fat, protein, carbohydrate, soluble fiber and alcohol. And you can take in non-energy providing mass such as insoluble fiber, vitamins, minerals and water. And you don't consume or eat calories because calories are heat energy and heat is not used for metabolic processes. Instead you eat foods and different foods have differing amounts of chemical potential energy which can be released as the food is metabolized. This chemical energy stored in your food is then converted into work, thermal energy or it can be stored and yes that includes your fat tissue. Although calories can give you an idea of the energy in your food, they're a poor gauge of how much that energy is actually derivable and how much your body actually utilizes. Which leads me to my next point. Counting calories can't account for the difference between available energy and effective energy. Available energy, or primary energy as it's sometimes called, is the amount of energy that can be used to do work. Effective or usable energy is the amount of energy that's actually used to do the work. One way to understand this concept more clearly is to think of a car that runs on petrol. The petrol has a certain amount of energy stored in the chemical bonds, and this is the available energy. However, not all of this energy can be converted into motion and move the car along. Some of it is lost as heat, noise or emissions, and this is the ineffective or useless energy. 
The effective energy is the energy that's left over and actually used to move the car along. When it comes to the human body, available energy is the total amount of energy contained in the food that you eat, while effective energy is the amount that's left to be utilized after digestion, absorption, and metabolic processes take place. To help illustrate this better, let's look at a good example. Let's say you're given an extra 70 grams or 280 calories worth of pure protein each day on top of your normal intake for seven days. Then on a separate occasion, you did the same in weight and caloric terms with pure sugar each day. All other things being equal, which scenario do you think will result in the most fat gain? You can bet with confidence that the sugar scenario will add more body fat. Why? Well, there's a few reasons, but for one, protein is preferentially allocated into your lean bodily structures like your muscles. Secondly, protein is not the body's preferred fuel source. The body clearly preferences fats and carbohydrates for energy production more so than protein. And a third major reason is the higher thermic effect of protein. The thermic effect of food is the energy required above your body's resting metabolic rate for digestion, absorption, and disposal of the ingested nutrients. Protein has a much higher thermic effect, and this is because protein has more complex amino acid structures that need to be broken down, and this requires more of the body's energy than it would for use for simpler structures such as those of fats or carbohydrates. So consuming foods with less effective energy, like high protein foods, can mean that the body has to use more of its stored energy, such as body fat, to meet its energy needs. But if energy utilization is all about calories in versus calories out, and you have a meal that's exactly half protein and half carbohydrate, you're apparently going to have the same amount of effective energy after consuming both. This is clearly not the case. And no, the answer to getting leaner is not eating a diet of just pure protein. As I mentioned before, protein is not a great fuel source and a person needs enough of the other essential nutrients to function. Which brings me to my next point, exercise and so-called calories out. A lot of people try and count the calories in their food to get leaner, but they also mistakenly think that they can accurately gauge their energy expenditure from measuring calories out on various fitness apps and devices. Most of these are by no means an accurate guide to how much energy you're really expending, and they also don't account for many individual variances. And even if these tools were somehow accurate, they don't account for which specific substrate is being utilized for energy, e.g. glucose or fat. Instead, they simply spit up a rough guess of calories burned, which is another problem in and of itself. This is because calories are not the energy currency of the body. ATP is. ATP is the powerhouse of your cells, and it's required for all exercise to take place. The amount of ATP you have is fixed, and it's utilized and replenished by the breakdown of macronutrients through different metabolic pathways. But not all macronutrients are broken down to generate ATP in the same way or at the same rate. The amount of ATP produced depends on the availability of oxygen, the type and intensity of the activity, and the condition of the individual. For instance, high intensity activities like heavy resistance training rely predominantly on the ATP and glycolytic systems, which are fast metabolic pathways to generate ATP. However, when your body's at rest or performing activities at a lower intensity, like walking, your body will rely predominantly on the oxidative system to generate ATP at a slower rate. To utilize the glycolytic system to generate ATP, your body uses available glucose for energy. And which fuel source does the body predominantly rely on for the oxidative system? Fat. Fat is far more energy dense fuel source, and I don't mean this in a caloric sense. To give you an example, during lower intensity activities, one gram of a long chain fatty acid like palmitic acid can yield roughly twice as many molecules of ATP than one gram of glucose. But as you can see in this graphic, the metabolic pathways we use are not like a switch that you turn on and off, but rather they encompass your overall energy system and they overlap. Each pathway can be fueled to varying degrees by different energy substrates, depending on the substrate makeup of the person's diet. For instance, let's say you mainly exercise at lower intensities using the oxidative pathway. If you're fat adapted and consume predominantly dietary fat as your main fuel source, not only will you derive more sustainable energy from the dietary fat while doing this form of exercise, you'll also more easily tap into your body fat stores once your dietary fats are depleted because you have very little glycogen to use. On the other hand, if you consume more carbs relative to fat, your body will use both fat and carbs to fuel the exercise and you'll burn less fat because glucose is also competing for metabolism. So given the nature of the energy systems and the varying makeups of a person's diet, how can the number of calories burned on a fitness device possibly be accurate? Particularly when it doesn't know how much ATP was generated from fat versus other macronutrients. And this is one of the main issues with trying to track calories out. It's not telling most people what they really want to know, how much fat they're actually utilizing. If you want to drop as much body fat as possible, it's best to start matching the energy substrate that you're consuming to the degree of intensity and the main energy pathway that you're using. 
Too many people use the wrong fuel source for the wrong type of activity, and that includes no activity. But if you're still someone who really believes that tracking calories out has validity for weight management and body composition, for accuracy's sake, you should go inside a respiration chamber to monitor your carbon dioxide production, and you should also start burning your in a closed barrel to measure the energy output, because it's gonna assure you that there'll be a lot of calories that you'll have missed if you don't. And the final reason why the calorie counting approach to weight loss is flawed is that when people follow the advice to implement a calorie deficit to lose fat, they by default undereat dietary fat, which is an essential nutrient, and overeat an unessential nutrient, namely carbohydrates. This is because fat has nine calories per gram, while carbs has only four. This leads many people to believe that they'll gain more weight consuming the more energy dense nutrient than they will consuming the less energy dense one. For instance, if given the option between having a high fat food and a high carb food because the calories are the same, the logic for most people is to choose something like a piece of toast with jam on it instead of a small handful of almonds because the former seems to be bigger and more appetizing, but it also fits within their calories. And at this point, you're probably wondering what should I keep track of if not calories? Well, I answer this in my other video, which I mentioned earlier, which I'll put a link for in the description below, along with some other info. That's it for this video and why calorie counting is flawed. Do check out the other video I just mentioned, and I'll see you next time.